Welcome back. Uh, we're going to get started with our panel on crime and criminal adjudication in the Latinx context. My name is Alicia Varani. I'm the Associate Director of the Criminal Justice Program here at the Law School, and I will be moderating this panel of fantastic people. Each panelist will give a, pre a short presentation, and we'll do some moderated dialogue, and then take some questions from the audience. Um, so we'll start with um, Clara Stevens. Uh, I'm Clara. I'm a researcher for the National Registry of Exonerations. I'm here to talk about Latinx people in exonerations and false convictions. I co-wrote this paper with three people at the registry, Maurice Posley, who's here, Catherine Grosso, who's here and on the next panel, and Barbara O'Brien, who I'm sure wishes she was here because it's February and she's in Michigan. Um, okay, so um, the registry, this is our front page. We track every known exoneration in the United States since 1989. Um, an exoneration happens when a person who has been convicted of a crime is officially cleared based on new evidence of innocence. That's kind of a general definition. Uh, we like to say that we tell stories and we count things. Um, you can find a write-up of each of the 2,372 cases currently in the registry on our website. We also code every case for inclusion in our database with over 200 variables. And the goal is ultimately to find out um, why wrongful convictions happen, um, and in the hopes that this knowledge can be applied to all aspects of the criminal justice system. Um, so I'm going to tell you some stories of Latinx exonerees and then talk briefly about the numbers and how these stories are indicative of some of the special challenges and vulnerabilities Latinx people face in wrongful convictions. And you'll excuse me, I'm gonna do a lot of reading because I tend to get so excited about these stories that I go off on tangents, so I'm trying to limit my time here. Um, this is Vicente Benavides. Um, he spent 25 years on California's death row before he was exonerated last year. Um, his case is really a perfect example of how language barriers can prejudice a defendant in ways that are almost invisible, unless, like Vicente's lawyers did, you look really hard, and some of his lawyers are actually here right now, today. Um, <clears throat> so Vicente, um, he only spoke Spanish. He was convicted in 1993 of raping his girlfriend's 20-month-one-old daughter to death. Um, the California Supreme Court vacated his conviction and death sentence last year after finding that the forensic evidence presented in his case was just grossly false. Um, and it makes sense that the, the court focused on the forensics because they were really <laughs> unconscionably bad, but there were issues with the quality of interpretation in his case that undoubtedly prejudiced him. Um, his interpreters at trial were just completely unqualified. They often provided just totally literal translations uh, that ended up sounding confusing or odd. So just as an example, um, when Vicente said, me sentí mal, the translators translated that as, um, I feel bad. Um, but uh, another translation could have been, I didn't feel well. And that's a huge difference when you're assigning guilt. I felt bad, that could mean I felt bad about what I did, not I feel sick. Um, so Vicente also showed confusion at times during his testimony, which came off as defensiveness and evasion. And the prosecutor really capitalized on this to make him out to be a liar who couldn't keep his story straight. Um, his post-conviction lawyers argued that this deprived him of a fair trial and documented the many ways in which he was prejudiced. But unless somebody really reads the 400 pages of briefs that they filed in this case, you think that this story was just about the terrible forensics, because that is what the court decided it on. Um, and it was too, you know, just not exclusively. Um, so this is uh, Clemente Aguirre. He was released from death row in Florida last year. Um, he was convicted of the murder of his friends and neighbors in 2004. He discovered the bodies, but because he was an undocumented immigrant and from Honduras and had left Honduras because of gang violence um, and being pressured to join a gang, uh, he did not call the police. And so the evidence that he left behind when he discovered them was used at trial. Um, he was eventually exonerated by evidence that the, his friend's daughter, who testified against him at trial, was the actual person that killed him. Um, but he was not released from um, detention when he was exonerated. He didn't have one of those triumphant walking out of prison pictures 
because he was immediately taken into ICE custody and detained. So Clemente and Vicente are two of uh, 281 Latinx exonerees. Um, you can see here overall, white people make up 38% of exonerees, black people make up 48% of exonerees, and Latinx people make up 12% of exonerees. Coding race and ethnicity um, has its challenges. Um, we talked about that a lot this morning, and especially if, like us, you're relying on court documents. So that story about the correction, wanting to change um, his race and the corrections officer threatening to beat him, that rings pretty true. Um, if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to answer them later. So based on these numbers, um, do we think that Latinx people are underrepresented in known exonerations? You know, in other words, is there any reason to think that wrongly convicted Latinx defendants are less likely to be exonerated than their non-Latinx counterparts? So obviously the best comparison um, is against Latinx people who are falsely convicted of crimes, but if we had that information, I would not be giving this presentation. Um, so we can't know how many people in prison are wrongfully convicted. So though, though imperfect um, incarceration data, specifically prison admissions, is probably the best point of comparison, uh, in large part because most exonerations happen in really serious cases because exonerations are really difficult to obtain. Um, so um, when we look at the demographics of people admitted to prison compared to exonerations of convictions that occurred in the same year, we see a disparity. So like if you see at 2004 there, that's of exonerations of convictions that happened in 2004. So whether the exoneration happened 2008, 2012, 2016. So uh, what could the source of this disparity be? There are really two possible explanations. One is that um, Latinx people are falsely convicted at lower rates, or that um, falsely convicted Latinx defendants are less likely to be exonerated. Um, these are not mutually exclusive explanations, but for several reasons we believe that the latter, that falsely convicted Latinx defendants are less likely to be exonerated is much more likely. So why do we think that? Um, just one, looking at patterns and exonerations, it appears that the same factors that are present in all false convic convictions are at work across the board and that Latinx defendants are not uniquely vulnerable or not vulnerable to them. So there have been whole books written about them, but these are things like official misconduct hiding evidence, um, mistaken witness identifications, false confessions, um, etc. cetera. So, um, However, um, it is clear that Latinx people are uniquely vulnerable in a couple of ways, um, and that is with language barriers and immigration factors. Um, so I do want to note here, and we've, it's been noted across the board this morning, um, that the population of Latinx defendants and suspects is really not homogenous. Um, while Latinx people as a whole may be more vulnerable to language barriers and immigration factors, it's not the same for everyone. Uh, for example, this exoneree from LA, from Linwood actually, Frankie Carrillo, um, he is a native English speaker and immigration issues did not play a direct role in his wrongful conviction, but we do know that these factors matter. So we can see the immigration factor at work in Clemente's case, but he's not alone. Um, there are cases in the registry where the uh, government had exculpatory witnesses deported, um, where prosecutors coerced a plea by offering a charge that would not make a defendant deportable, um, and cases where citizens were falsely convicted of entering the country illegally. Um, and we can also see the vulnerability to language barriers that plays in Vicente's case, and he is also not unique. There are many exonerations in the registry where the same thing happened. You know, a lack of command of English was exploited by police and prosecutors. Um, in 13 of the false confessions given by Latinx exonerees, a lack of English skills directly contributed to the confession, whether that was the officer saying, okay, this is what you wrote, please sign, and it contained a bunch of information that they never said, or when they interpreted what they said um, to mean something totally different, like in Vicente's case. So ultimately, we can't really quantify how often um, immigration and language barriers contribute to false convictions partly because of their nature, which I can discuss later if you like, and partly because of the nature of court decisions, but we think it's a reasonable inference to say that language barriers are one way that Latinx defendants may be more vulnerable to the risk of false convictions. 
So why aren't there more exonerations of Latinx defendants if they're not you know, more or less likely to be falsely convicted? Um, it's a lot of the same factors, um, language, immigration, um, you know, a quarter of the exonerations in the registry have somebody who recanted. And if you're faced with perjury charges, if you're not a citizen, that makes you deportable. So people are less likely, less willing to recant in cases, even if it's the police that coerce them. Um, and, you know, it's strange to say this since they were both on death row, but Clemente and Vicente were the lucky ones. They had post-conviction lawyers who worked hard and understood the unique challenges. <coughs> Freddie was also lucky uh, because he was able to advocate for himself. Um, in an investigator's notes in English, he found that another man had actually confessed to the crime he was convicted of. And once all of the witnesses were presented with that information, they admitted that one guy told them to ID Frankie and that guy told, told them that the police had identified him to him. Um, so the little bit of good news, and I'm wrapping up, I promise, um, is that innocence organizations are not oblivious to this need. Um, some organizations like the California Innocence Project have intakes form, intake forms available in Spanish now. Um, there was a panel on this at, um, at last year's Innocence Network conference, and um, there have been grants given to different innocence projects to focus on Latinx people in general. So things may start slowly changing and the disparity may lessen over time, but we're gonna have to wait and see because it takes on average 10 years from conviction to exonerate somebody. Next up we have uh, Jeffrey Ulmer. I'm a sociologist um, and I've uh, mostly studied um, courts and sentencing and court case processing with with a focus on um, a variety of types of disparity and discrimination um, and differential impact. Um, and there are many sites of discrimination, racism, and disparity in the criminal justice system, um, in this case affecting Latinx people prior to sentencing decisions, and I'm very mindful of that. Um, and sentencing decisions are made by judges, but they're also driven by prosecutors through the guilty plea process. Um, and that's nowhere more true than the federal courts, which I'll be talking about shortly. Um, there are also many processes that go into sentencing decisions that aren't captured in statistics, like the ones I'll present to you. So, so it's, a, it's a rich processual set of interactions and decision making and interpretation that's very fine grained and, and you know you don't see that in like nationwide or statewide statistics on sentencing. Um, and so we need ultimately we need qualitative and um, narrative kind of research that, that digs into that. But I think there is value in examining large scale patterns in uh, punishment decisions and how they how they vary. So first of all um, Latinx uh, disparity, discrimination, disadvantage in, in criminal punishment his, is demonstrated by a lot of research um, that exists. And so that's one conclusion. And the other, another conclusion is that it's not uniform. Um, it varies, uh, and it varies by a couple of key features. First, uh, citizenship status. Citizenship status. Um, <clears throat> has been studied by uh, several projects by uh, Michael Light, Ryan King, others um, in the federal courts, uh, less so in the state courts, but, uh, but there's a little bit of that um, in, in Florida. The other way that, uh, that uh, sentencing disparity affect, di sentencing disadvantage affecting uh, Latinx um, people is by context, by place. Um, and the focus of this research that, that I'm talking about today is on immigration contexts, what we call immigration destinations in sociology. Um, and there are, there are different theories in sociology, one, one uh, group threat theory, um, which uh, depicts that um, repression of uh, minorities that the white majority sees as, 
as uh, threatening um, is is uh, less pronounced where where uh, where uh, marginalized groups are are small in population, but it grows as immigration grows, as as the presence grows, and then it drops down. So it's kind of an inverted U shape. Um, so that so that uh, um, through you know intergroup contact, uh, there's less repression when when there are large large uh, communities of color or uh, in in any context majorities and minorities. Um, this prediction hasn't hasn't really panned out in research on um, punishment disadvantage among Latinx people. Um, it hasn't turned out that way, and I'll show you more about that. Um, research, an ongoing research project that um, that I'm doing with uh, one of my colleagues at Penn State, Brandy Parker. Um, focuses on different kinds of, of uh, threat, different kinds of immigrant threat, um, perceptions of, of immigrant criminal threat and how it varies by um, immigration context. And in, in sociology, a number of sociologists made the distinction between traditional destination, immigrant destinations, um, new destinations, which were De uh, places that experienced a large increase in uh, Latinx communities in the 90s and then emerging destinations in the 2000s. Um, and so we look at sentencing patterns um, across these types of destinations. And I'm, I won't, this will be in the, the paper, but I won't have time to go through all this. I can go back to it. But uh, this particular study um, by, by uh, Parker and I, we found that contrary to the, the sociological racial group threat theory, um, number one, I, I should say it's very clear that, that uh, punishment disadvantage um, uh, for Latinx defendants does vary by place, does vary by court context, just not in the way described by group, group threat theory. Um, it's where um, Latinx defendants are sentenced most harshly is where they're least numerous in places which have little or no immigration. Um, Trump country. Um, that's where Latinx defendants really get hammered. Um, much, much less so in traditional destinations like Los Angeles, like San Antonio, like, like, or in fed, these, you know, federal courts, Southern California, um, South Florida, um, New Mexico, but also places like uh, Northern Illinois, Eastern New York. Um, and we found evidence of what we called persistent threat, um, which is the new destinations um, exhibited heightened Latinx disadvantage at, in, in federal sentencing, the new destinations of, of, of 2000, the places that saw large rapid increases in um, Latinx immigrant populations in the 90s, reacted with threat, reacted with heightened punishment. And then also, in both time periods, the, um, the non-destinations, the places that are not immigrant destinations. Um, that those are the places that really punish um, Latinx uh, defendants most harshly. This is, uh, and um, I should say citizenship status, C citizenship status conditions this so that the, the punishment disadvantage concentrates among the undocumented, especially in the later time period, especially in in uh, the, the late 2000s, circa 2010. So let me also talk about um, one of these um, new, by, by some measures you could say new destination, and by another measure you could say it's an emerging destination, but Pennsylvania, um, where I'm from. Um, Pennsylvania um, has great, variation in 
uh, Latinx communities across the state. Um, some counties um, have virtually none, others have very large ones. Actually, uh, Latinx people concentrate in the southeast of the state of Pennsylvania, from Philadelphia, say, over to Lancaster County and, and Harrisburg, the state capital, Gettysburg, York. Um, and so we looked at, to see if this pattern of uh, disadvantage by, by uh, destinations occurs within cities or within, within the state. And we found, again, we didn't have measures of citizenship uh, in, in the state data, data, but it's the places with small uh, court caseload presence, presences, um, and it's the places with small populations of Latinx people where their odds of imprisonment are much, much higher, statistically significantly higher than in places with even medium or large either caseloads or population. And then that's uh, This is in, in the uh, later time period. This is, this is immigration. So look here. It's the, this bar. That's the places with, liter with minimal change in, in uh, immigration. So the counties where, where Latinx defendants end up, um, where there's little or no immigration, little or no um, uh, Latinx population, that they really have a much higher uh, likelihood of going to prison. Um, and these are all, all the charts I've shown you are from multivariate models that control for um, a variety of legally relevant sentencing factors like sentencing guidelines factors, pleading guilty, number of counts, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, um, these are comparisons that are, this, are similar but for their, their uh, Latinx status. Um, so in conclusion, we, we reiterate that uh, um, punishment disadvantage, heightened punishment of Latinx defendants is conditioned by, shaped by citizenship status, especially in the federal courts, and place, um, in this case, immigration contexts, uh, traditional, new, or non-immigrant um, destinations. Thank you. Um, no, I think I'll sit. Make sure to behave. I'm taking this and sending it to my mother. <laughs> All right, to sort of turn it around so if you're not wide awake and looking, just picture her throwing her chunkle at you, you know, to kind of wake you up, right? Because I know it's late in the afternoon. This is a, this is a story, actually. Uh, we're Latino communities safer than others. Some surprising findings from San Antonio. I just happened to uh, be born and raised in San Antonio. Um, some of you might remember in previous uh, meetings that we've been here, I used to come in with my San Antonio Spurs uh, hats and. Um, now I'm doing time in Boston, so it's a, it's a little bit of a different story. Um, you know, one 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 thing I want to talk about when we're, we're talking about the introduction here is is to remind people that um, there's this clear and consistent finding when we talk about immigration, we talk about immigration and crime, we talk about immigration at the community uh, level. There's a consistent finding that more immigrants means less crime. Those of us who have been engaged in this type of research for many years have been looking at this topic. We've been looking at the direct and indirect impact of immigration as a demographic factor. And this is something that we found at the community level, at the city level, at the state level, at the na 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 national level. That's the clear and consistent finding about the benefits of immigration, right? More immigrants that move into different cities, move into different communities, that factor has been um, consistently linked to a decrease in crime, right? It, it's not, you know, of course, it's clear and unequivocal 
what, what is it, unequivocable or something? Um, when we look at this type of research, right? Um, the other thing is that now we're looking at this research again and we see that same sort of finding, at least after 1990. Um, the, how changes in immigration in different communities have contributed to changes in crime. People are talking about the decline in, uh, in violent crime, and one of the issues with respect to that, of course, is the way in which uh, sociologists and criminologists have been talking about or, or making that connection. Um, we're, we're talking about the decrease in Latino violence and homicides in many areas across the United States, and again, that's something that's clear and consistent. Um, what's not clear and consistent, of course, is how, well, how clear that, that factor is when we talk about or look at the immigration and crime literature. That literature is evolving, it's expanded, it's extended. People are looking at immigration in different sorts of ways, in different contexts, in the legal, in the legal um, area, in sociolegal studies, in criminological studies, criminal justice studies, recidivism. So we continue to see that um, positive impact, but what about in the past, right? What about when we're talking about um, a period of transformation? In this case, I make the um, argument in this paper that uh, we should go back and look at a period of uh, historic transformation in the Latino community, what we used to call the Mexican-American community. I think I'm old enough to remember when I was a Chicano Right, which I think was a few years ago. Um, why study uh, Mexican Americans or, or Chicanos from 1960 to 1980? This is important, I think, to think about well, not only where what the research is right now, but also to go back to the past. Right, I think it's important to make those connections to the present. I think it's important to go back and sort of look at the origins of the communities as they developed after World War II. And this is something that I'm going to. Um, um, call for in this paper. Um, this is something that I think helps us understand, right, sociologically, criminologically, the, the uh, development of community and crime studies. Up until very <coughs> recently, Latinos, Mexican Americans were sort of left out. But I think it's important to go back and, and bring us um, back into this literature. I think it's important as, as well to remind people so when we look at places like Texas, for example, after World War II, uh, discrimination was rampant, right? When we talk about housing, education, and employment, it wasn't until my lifetime that most people even graduated from high school, right? I actually think in 1980, the year I graduated from high school, it might have been the first time that most people had a high school degree, right? Um, I know I, the 1980 uh, year is... Uh, a mystery to some people because I've been lying about my age for so so long. I, have, I think this is the first setting I've really admitted. I did graduate from high school in 80. Um, but those, you know, we mentioned, I mentioned that because it's important, right? Looking at those, um, making sure to make those connections again when we talk about, well, not only housing and, um, and education and employment, but, but also crime. The other thing is, you know, I think it's important to look at these historical effects of what we call of what I call disadvantage, right? This is a term that Bill Wilson and his colleagues uh, conceptualized and talked about in the late 80s, but this is a period in which, uh, you know, again, Latinos, Mexican Americans were sort of left out of that period, and I think it's important to, um, to um, revisit that period, um, look at the connection, look at the gap between Mexican Americans and Anglos during this time period, remind people that uh, transformation in the 1950s was important, Right, World War II veterans were returning, expecting full membership. Um, the Anglo-Mexican gap was at its widest with respect to ed education, income, and occupation. It was widest in the state of Texas. The movement, right, that movement that we talked about from rural Texas into urban Texas cities and other places in the 50s and the 60s, over a million people moved from rural Texas into urban Texas cities. And that's something that I, don't, I think we need to um, uh, bring back in and think about you know, his, if historical inequality matters, and if so, if, does this type of historical disadvantage, is it something that contributed to more crime or less crime? Is it something that that gap still contributes to um, today? And I think I'm going to move on to the um, um, 
talk about uh, some of the findings that we have here. These are descriptive data of um, San Antonio communities from 1960 to 1980. Um, 1960s, the first year in which census tract data was available in, in San Antonio. Um, 1970s, an important period. I end in 1980. After the 80s, it was the, the city had changed. It was a very different type of a story um, in San Antonio and other southwestern cities as well. Most of you remember that in 1981, Henry Cisneros, well, maybe some of you don't remember that, but in 1981, Henry Cisneros was elected mayor of San Antonio and the, um, the trajectory of the city you know, changed after that. So I'm interested in you know, um, reminding us again about the way in which um, crime was affected in 1960 to 80, um, the designations, the ways in which it unfolded and whether or not we're, we're going to see if that immigration component, here it's called percent foreign born, 1960, 70, and 80 was relatively low. You'll see that the percent foreign born was 5.79% in 1960, 5.69 in 1970, and 7.5 in 1980. This is actually table four, it uh, got cut off. I just wanted you again, Remember, we're talking about the contemporary finding about immigration. This is, there's also, I think, I think it's also important to go back and, say, and examine if there was a previous, a past, a clear finding um, here as well, and that finding is that there's a null effect. And the reason I mention this is because, well, there's really no right evidence, right, about that crime-prone myth, at least at, at the community level, of how more immigrants contribute to more crime. We don't see that in this by the border city. We don't see that in this 10th largest city in the United States. We don't see that in any other city that I know of in the southwestern United States. And if we st think about the historical relationship, right, this sort of imagery of people crossing the border, coming into downtown areas, uh, you know, stealing tickets to go see Ozzy Osbourne or whatever it was that people were doing in the 70s in San Antonio. Uh, what we do see, though, is this clear and consistent finding, at least for the most part, in 1960s, 70s, and total homicides as well, of economic disadvantage. Some of the data that uh, Bill Wilson was talking about in Chicago and other Midwestern and Northeastern cities, we see that same sort of effect here. Again, a reminder about the gap with respect to um, levels of um, high school education, percent poverty, um, unemployment, all those factors combined, right, created this consistent finding in, um, in San Antonio. As economic disadvantage went up, as it increased over time, um, the level of homicides increased in San Antonio. So it's, it's never certain, but yes, more immigration means less crime, or at least a null effect. Um, this is something we've seen again, how immigrants move in and contribute to crime, but in general, they're less born than the violent crime. This is something we also see in the community level in this historic data that took me 10 years to collect, uh, condense, uh, linked to 1960 census tract data, and right here you see three columns that more or less uh, gives you a story about what I've done with uh, the past 10 years and how I spent most of my life. Thank you. Is that it? That's it. we turn it on? Okay. So it's a real honor to be here, and I want to again thank uh, our organizers for putting on yeah. this. Yeah. And to all of you here who stayed on late on a Friday afternoon, uh, for me, this is great weather. When I left home, it was, it was 10 degrees. So this is fabulous uh, for me. Um, there are those whose research has helped me immensely, and I need to acknowledge Laura Gomez. I don't think she's here right now. Um, Kevin Johnson, who I had the great uh, fortune to host uh, at a psychology law conference in Long Beach just a couple of years ago. Um, he, Ian Haney Lopez. Um, 
uh, Amado Padilla of Stanford, uh, my relative, and Albert Ramirez of UC Boulder. Al Albert has uh, spoken about the ramifications for Hispanics um, of living in an unequal social power and social influence system. And that's been really helpful for me, helpful uh, to me to think about the way he conceptualized of uh, this inequality. Um, I want to also thank Sherry Johnson for contacting me to attend this conference. It was a joy to meet her. Uh, and finally, I want to acknowledge uh, that we are on Tongva and Shomish land uh, because native lands are really important uh, uh, to be remembered. So while the focus about biased legal system uh, has been the black-white binary, uh, anti-Latino bias is not new. Mexicans being labeled as mongrels, unprogressive, uh, and greasers was a common occurrence even by lawmakers uh, and even by judges, including Supreme Court just, uh, justices. Uh, uh, and Levi Woodbury was actually the first one who ever had a law degree uh, who sat on uh, SCOTUS. So it's been around for a very long time. Like blacks, thousands of Mexicans uh, were lynched and often for the same reasons, except acting too Mexican was also a predictor of being lynched. Case law reflects, reflects these biases. The most famous case, and many of you may know this case, comes from people Visa Mora, uh, commonly called the Sleepy Lagoon case. It was the largest mass trial in California history. Uh, at trial, the attorney could not confer with clients. The defendants could not cut their hair or change their clothes, but this was used as evidence of their criminal character. Um, a Los Angeles Sheriff's Office employee uh, acted as an expert and testified Mexicans had a bloodthirst and a biological predisposition to crime and killing, citing the culture of their ancestors. Most research on race bias fits into a model that predicts racial disparities. And as you can see, the model is complicated, uh, hence the difficulty in developing a simple, comprehensive explanation um, for racial disparities, particularly for Latinos. Past research has shown bias at various stages. By 1970, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights found widespread abuse against Mexican Americans in the Southwest. Um, moreover, research has been conducted on jury composition, use of evidence, judges' behaviors, and sentencing. Based on aversive racism theory, we have examined the influence of non-race-related cues, something like socioeconomic status, or SES, on culpability assignment for Mexican Americans compared to whites. The idea behind aversive racism theory is that we find it aversive to think of ourselves as being racist. So we will only show racism when it's uh, coupled with some kind of non-race-related cue that allows us to demonstrate bias. We conducted two studies, one at the University of Nebraska and one at the University of Texas El Paso. Uh, we believed that the inclusion of SES status and type of crime, car theft or art theft, uh, would produce bias against a Latino defendant. In other words, is it race, is it SES, or is it the type of crime that produces biases? We found that whites at UNL uh, gave the low SES Mexican-American-based uh, American, American biased culpability assessments um, compared to the Mexican American of high SES or to whites regardless of their SES. As they were hitting on uh, the Mexican American of low SES for culpability. Uh, there were no effects for Mexican American participants at the University of Texas El Paso. They didn't show any bias. Um, so for responsibility, just to give you an idea of what we found, for responsibility, for blame, for belief, for verdict, uh, low SES Mexican Americans received biased assessments. And this is the kind of basic paradigm that we've been using now for a whole line of research. Uh, and this again just shows you that attributions about personality or character traits were also biased with those low uh, status, uh, of those of low status crime, uh, low SES Mexican Americans are receiving the negative trait ratings. So a variety of tra negative trait ratings. Since that study, we've examined a number of factors to test the limits of this bias. For example, uh, we looked to see if it would smear onto the attorney uh, who represented the low SES Mexican American defendant, and the answer is yes, it did. Um, 
uh, we found that using the same procedures as before, um, either the Mexican American or the white uh, defendant, we replicated the early results for the low SES Mexican American defendant. Uh, but the Mexican American attorney who represented the low SES Mexican American defendant uh, was also denigrated. Their client was thought more responsible, uh, had more intent, was believed less, and was more blameworthy than the other conditions. With other types of crimes, we found the, the effect as well. So we did a study here in Orange County at the courthouse with participants coming out of uh, Vineyard. And we uh, ran a first degree murder case with mitigating information uh, with the white sample. Uh, while the, so the white sample gave the low SES Mexican American defendant with weak mitigating evidence the most death sentences and the high SES white defendant with strong mitigating evidence the most prison sentences. The Latinos in that uh, coming out of that sample uh, did not show the bias. With second degree murder and immigration status, the undocumented low SES Mexican American defendant was given a guilt verdict uh, more often and given the most severe punishment compared to undocumented Mexican or Canadians regardless of their status. So then we thought, well, what about minor offenses? And this time uh, we, we uh, did a study with minor offenses, like things like city ordinance violations, like jaywalking. Uh, whites compared to Latinos thought it was more justified to stop and question and stop and detain the Latino than the white offender. So in a variety of different uh, cases, we find the same effect. This is just to give you an indication of the strength of the findings so you can see what these differences look like. The Mexican immigrant defendant of low SES received the most guilty verdicts. That's that tall gray uh, bar. Uh, and the Mexican undocumented immigrant received the most prison sentences with no chance of uh, parole. And that's again that tall uh, gray bar. So these are strong effects. These aren't weak effects. Our newest path takes us to the issue of exoneration. In a first pilot study, we looked at a variety of different factors, but we found that most people do not know what an exoneree is. Um, but they think that those who have been incarcerated have something wrong with them. We modified two actual news articles from a recent Kansas exoneration case and changed the name to indicate a Latina or a white exoneree. The names were pre-tested for ethnic categorization and identification. The term exoneration and exoneree were explained within the article itself. Prior to reading, few understood what an exoneree was, but after reading the article, nearly everyone identified, correctly identified uh, what an exoneree was. We asked a series of questions about culpability and criminality. Uh, and we examined the issue of essentialism. Essentialism means that a person has an inherent belief that one's outward characteristics are indicative of your inward, uh, if your inward characteristics. So those high in essentialism uh, believe uh, that race categories are, uh, people of a race category share certain traits, that those traits are inherited, that they're immutable, and that everyone within the race category shares in those traits. We're still analyzing data, but these results um, provide evidence of the bad, uh, supposed bad character of Mexican-American defendants uh, and exonerees. They are inherently more criminal, and so are their children. So how likely is it that this exoneree's children would become criminals? Uh, the answer for those high essentialism is resounding yes, they would. So, what is, so whether it's 1843 or 2018, uh, legal actors have explicitly demonstrated a belief uh, in the bad character of, of Mexican Americans. And Latinos got the message. Uh, are, they're more likely to believe that discrimination is a major problem for them. And this has grown over time. I want to finally thank my students, past and current students, who have worked on some of these issues with me, and thank you so much for listening to me as well. Thank you so much to all the panelists. So my first question is, we just heard a lot of really rich 
data, um, qualitative and quantitative. And I would like to know from each of you, in terms of the different audiences that are making the determinations that are leading to bad outcomes for Latinx communities, whether it be the public, law enforcement, judges, um, how have you seen or how would you like to see this data employed or deployed to um, sort of start to shift what's happening in the trends that you're seeing? Oh, I'm starting. <laughs> Whoever okay. would like to start. Um, <clears throat> well, we've seen that a lot of uh, data on exonerations is already being used to change policy. So um, just recently, New York State passed some new laws about how um, um, show-ups, lineups, identifications are done, in part because it's shown that there is a lot of, there are a lot of biases and things like that. Um, I would be interested to see how um, this could be applied to Latinx communities. As I said a little bit, um, is it, they're not a homogenous community. Um, so what a lineup or a show up of um, Latinx suspects in San Antonio would look like is gonna look different than Miami, is gonna look different than New York, and you know. So, um, and there's been very little done on cross-racial identification when it comes to Latinx defendants. Um, there was a study done in, um, in San Antonio, I believe, um, where they proved that there is a, a cross-racial identification problem, as we know for sure is the case when white people are identifying black people and vice versa. But again, because of the unhomogenous nature of Latinx people, um, I think it would be interesting to see some work done on that and then applied as um, exoneration work already is um, to policy. And that's one of many. Thank you. Uh, so that's a that's a tough question, but um, I, I'd think of it this way. First, in my experience, uh, judges, especially prosecutors, um, people in the criminal justice system that work don't don't really um, see d don't really believe that there's bias, and when you say that well, actually the statistics show that there is, they tend to say, well, that's because this or that group commits worse crimes. And so the kind of research, you know, here, uh, and that I've done a lot of is like, actually, no, it's, we're, we're accounting for that. So it's, it's apples to apples and oranges to oranges um, in comparison. And the, you know, the, uh, the African-American or the Lat Latinx, uh, person gets a worse outcome, a more punitive sentence um, when they're otherwise comparable to a white person. And um, so I'd like that to just be visible, first of all, to the to criminal justice actors and the media. And, and uh, because I, I think at least one, one um, first step of addressing uh, bias and, and uh, inequalities is to make them visible. Um, and then two is to sh and to show the great variation um, across places, like and and to point out that you know some court jurisdictions are way out of whack with others. Um, I think of the you know the the panel that's next, which is the death penalty, capital punishment, and how highly highly localized that is. Um, it's the same kind of th that's just a general theme in sentencing research in general is just how. Um, widely variable it is by place, and so you could kind of point out the places where um, um, where Latinx people are treated most harshly, and say, "Look, you're you're really um, you stand out. Um, you're stand out in your repression." Um, I guess you know the same thing. Just a couple of of, of you know points, of course. You know, again, acknowledging that there's this old body of literature, it's clear, and, and again, it's consistent, more immigrants means less crime, right? I, I mean, we've been, re well, I've been repeating it for, I don't, I don't know, about 10 years, but I guess I've been repeating a lot of things too, uh, especially to myself, but it, it would be nice if other people <laughs> repeated it, right? I mean, you can, 
um, you know, uh, students of mine that are doing this thing on what's it called, Twitter, or you know, hashtags, or you know, something like that. I just got off the beeper, so I'm not sure what some of this social media stuff is. But you know, just you know, um, um, publicizing that fact, right? Connecting connecting it to literature, right? I, I mean, there's there's you know, a plethora of social media that's out there that links, right, um, articles to our research articles. Um, or, or that should, re, you know, link our research articles to editorials that should, you know, get out the good news, if you will, about the beneficial effects of, of immigration. Um, I think about people like, you know, Nicole. She's always, you know, out there, you know, giving, you know, giving talks. She's always on TV. She's always giving the good news about her research. There's got to be a way to disseminate, right, our work at the community level, you know, like that. More immigrants means less crime, and I think that's something that we can do in different contexts and different responses, uh, replying to, to, uh, to politicians, replying to anti-immigrant types, or just letting the public know about this research as well, I think is important. Um, with respect to um, the other stream of our research, the other findings is that you know, at the community level, um, economic disadvantage has long-term effects, right? So in San Antonio, again, guess what? The community that had the highest crime rate in 1960 still has the highest crime rate in, you know, in 2010. And I know that because, you know, I would go to my grandmother's house, and I would look at the picnic across the street, the picnic store or whatever on Guadalupe Street, and I knew that there was something odd going on there, um, even though I wasn't born in 1960. But, you know, well, okay, well, maybe parts of the 60s are, are clearer than others, but there was something odd, you know, going on there, and there was this, you know, very clearly, um, you know, markers of what we now refer to as disadvantage, right? And that hasn't changed. Right? Um, so there's something about um, the ways in which we service some types of communities over others. You all have been talking about that. We've been talking about, you know, whether it's mass incarceration or overactive policing or overactive immigration policing. I mean, this is something that's been, you know, clear and consistent as well. And I think um, it would be good to remind people about that as well, right? Um, I wouldn't create a hashtag like more immigrants means less crime, but there's something, there's another way in which we can link that information right, to the public and disseminate that information, you know, just like Nicole does on TV almost every day, every time I, I look at uh, MSNBC. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think there's a couple of ways. Uh, one is that I, actually the last time uh, I worked with an attorney, was an attorney here from Ca uh, California who was working on a death penalty case. And so helping uh, link attorneys with relevant literature, um, the literature is not nearly as um, deep for Latinos as it is for blacks, uh, looking at bias in any area of the law, uh, civil or criminal. Um, but linking attorneys with that literature when they need it uh, for a case is really important. Uh, and so that's one area I think that's, that my, at least my research uh, has been used. A second area where I think um, at least my research uh, has been uh, helpful uh, is to um, guide students. Uh, and so I teach out of a graduate program that's both JD, PhD. Our students get the, ju the, the dual degree. And some of them go into academia, either, either at law schools or not, a regular you know, college of arts and sciences. Uh, some of them go into practice. And so I think having access, even during education, uh, to the kinds of materials that um, and, and information I produce is helpful for them. I know it's helpful for them because they have contacted me later and said, oh my God, thank you so much. So uh, I think you know, that, so top down, that's, that's really kind of top down, right? Uh, but at the same time, I've given talks in the community. Um, most recently, you may not know this, but Nebraska had a lapse of time where they outlawed the death penalty. They had the death penalty, they outlawed the death penalty, they reinstated the death penalty. Uh, and so in that gearing up to get rid of the death penalty, um, I was contacted by an organization, which I won't mention, but because I haven't asked them if I'm good, but they asked me where do we go in Nebraska to gear this up so that we can approach the legislatures and get them to pass this 
this bill. And so I told the Catholic Church, I said, you know, because in Nebraska, if anything, the Catholic Church will back you up on it. And so, and they did. But then I, they also arranged for me to do a number of, like, town hall um, uh, presentations. Uh, and it passed. I was shocked, too. I fell over. I mean, I, it passed. Since then, they've reinstated it, uh, unfortunately. But so working from the top down, but also the bottom up, I think, uh, is really important uh, to, to, to inform everyone. Thank you for that. Um, and then given also um, what a lot of you have touched upon in terms of the construction of Latinx communities as perpetrators in this administration where that is the rhetoric every day, um, what are you seeing in terms of Latinx communities who um, are victims of crime and how that's sort of potentially um, having an impact on their ability to exercise their rights as victims? That, that, that's a good question. Um, in my case, uh, El, El Paso used to be a research site in, in part because you know I had a, a colleague that was I, I was able to collaborate with. But um, over the past 20 years, well, 15 years, um, you know, I'm a homicide researcher, right? So in order to research uh, homicides, there has to be homicides, right? There has I have to have data, right? So, you know, if you you know if you're looking at the border, there's a place like El Paso where, you know, the levels of of uh, of, of homicide, of violent crime, you know, crimes that we hear about, we're really concerned about, and we're you know carrying these you know super switchblades or whatever. You know, in, in our in the you know, it's, it's a weapon because we're afraid, right? Where there's protection, but there's no homicides, right? I stopped going because there's the data don't exist anymore, right? It, it, it's you know, if you want to study homicides in uh, El Paso, it, it's almost like studying deaths by lightning strikes, right? That it's so rare, right? And this is a, a large city; it's over half a million. The data have declined so much. They're practically non-existent, especially when you look at the community-level context. You're interested in community-level characteristics, and um, so it doesn't exist anymore. It's sort of evaporated, and um, so I, I think um, that's one thing I'd, I'd like to share is you know how much safer some Latino communities are than others. Um, and some of the victim right organizations or some of the people that were interested um, in that topic. Um, would be interested in, in uh, conveying that information as well. Now, this you know doesn't mean that you know other types of violence don't exist. You know they, they do, I'm sure. But when we're talking about serious crimes like homicides, right, like killings of you know intimates or um, arguments, um, you know whatever it is that we're talking about um, with, with respect to the motivations you know behind homicides, they've really declined and they've almost uh, evaporated there. So. Um, that was just something I thought I'd, I'd, I'd like to point out, especially in the current context. Uh, <clears throat> well, in exonerations, there's really uh, two types of victims. There's uh, the people who were falsely convicted, and then there are the victims of the crimes um, who are often re-victimized by the fact that um, it turns out that the person that they thought committed the crime against them or their family member didn't do it. And then they don't eventually have justice in that the right person is caught. So um, the way that I think the, the current climate is affecting this is that, um, for one thing, the um, ice holds and the detentions. Um, when I talked about Clemente, for example, he spent 25 years on death row and instead of being let out and made whole and trying to work on his asylum claim, immediately went to detention again and just was re-victimized again. And I can't say that that necessarily wouldn't have been the case in the Obama administration, um, but the climate has shown that, and it's happened more frequently in the past year or so of exonerations. Another example is a um, Cook County um, exoneration, Gabriel Solache, um, and he ended up self-deporting because he was like, I don't want to sit in ICE detention after having been on death row. Um, so I think that is one way. And then, of course, um, the victims of the crimes themselves, if the government is deporting witnesses, um, if they are preventing people from wanting to come forward to talk about it, um, then the people who are the victims of crimes or families of crime victims 
um, don't eventually get justice because it's a lot harder. So I would say that's one way it affects in exonerations. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Sure. Um, so I would say indirectly um, in terms of victims, uh, survivors. Um, so as, as part of our, our conceptual framework in, in uh, studying sentencing, uh, we talk about uh, focal concerns of punishment decisions. And, and it's a that's a mechanism by which the, the uh, equating of, of uh, African-American status or exceptions, um, as Professor Lopez talked about, the equating of, of exception statuses, exception communities with criminality occurs. And so, for example, um, the equating of uh, Latino males with dangerousness or the equating of uh, young African-American males with dangerousness or uh, Latina females with, with morally disrep being more, more morally blameworthy or, or, and then there's practical constraints too um, in terms of uh, resources and language barriers and, um, and uh, access to um, restorative or uh, treatment resources and so forth. And um, all of those are linked systematically to um, racialized or, or ethnic statuses. Um, and I could speculate that such a thing also could happen with victims. Um, and so that they would not be as taken seriously or, um, or crime in some communities that, and there's some sociological research on this might be seen as normative and well, that's just what happens. Um, so I think it, it, you know, what we describe on the punishment end could happen in reverse on the, on the, uh, on the victim end. Let's give one more round of applause to our panelists.